Thank you very much. I'm going to try to share my presentation. You can hear me and see my slides now, probably. Yes, we see your slides. Perfect. And we hear you. Well. So thank you for the invitation. And uh, I'm going to talk about, or I was asked to talk about AI in radiology. So that's going to be a minor part of it, because what we use mainly AI for is to interpret images and uh, process images, radiological images, but we use them for diagnostics and therapy mainly. So my name is, uh, as you can see there, and I lead a center, a national center for ultrasound image guided therapy at St. Olaf's Hospital. It's in close collaboration with uh, Sintef and NTNU. And we have been working in this center since uh, 1996, more or less. It was uh, changed in 2011, mainly. And we have had some spin-offs uh, companies that you can see on the far right side of this slide. There's some examples of spin-offs from this activity. Uh, actually, the GE ultrasound was part of this uh, collaboration between Sintef and NTNU that was spun off as an ultrasound company and later bought by GE, as you know. Here are just a list and uh, some snapshots from the activity and uh, the main clinical fields of research and development and innovation that we work on. Uh, I'm not uh, within the time frame I have today. I'm not going to be able to show you many examples. So I've chosen to show you more deeply one example, and that's from bronchoscopy in, in green on the left side. But uh, as you see from the snapshots, we are also involved in, in uh, image, guidance, image guidance during uh, different kinds of surgery. Uh, decision support systems in various clinical disciplines, and so on. Before I get to that, I just mentioned that uh, maybe many of you know, but not all of you know, that Sintef is a not-for-profit research institute, and St. Olaf's is one of the five university hospitals in uh, Norway, covering a base population of about uh, slightly under a million people. Uh, we recently, together with NTNU and uh, AI Lab, uh, we actually got uh, appointed a new Gemini Center uh, for medical imaging research and AI, together with uh, you guys at uh, Glossogen and several uh, partners at Donut AI in Trondheim. We, we found out that we basically have it all in Trondheim to establish a center like this. Uh, we have uh, research groups that are world leading in different fields. We have excellent uh, access to good students. We have uh, domain knowledge within this field of healthcare, and we have state of the art within AI and uh, large uh, databases and data access, uh, which is being, of course, uh, part of the barrier to get enough data out and to be able to work with all the data in an easy way. So this is being solved and this Gemini Center will be an important part of that work. Uh, in case there is uh, very little time at the end, I usually start by giving you my main message at the beginning, which is uh, some people find strange, but uh, the main message with my talk is basically that artificial intelligence is not going to replace medical doctors as far as we can see. The main thing is that this technology will be used by doctors to assist them and take some workload off them. And the medical professionals who use AI will basically replace those who will not use AI in the future. Uh, quite a few people think that this is the, the scenario that will play out. Anyway, you all know this. Uh, it is also true in medical image analysis that uh, the number of publications are increasing exponentially uh, since 2015, 16, when it uh, basically started really to, to increase. And uh, there are already, this is already an old publication, it's from 2017, showing some areas where deep learning can uh, surpass human performance when it comes to interpretation and detection of uh, objects and diseases in medical images. Uh, we actually work with quite a few of these, uh, these examples that are shown here, uh, both from, uh, from uh, neurosurgery, segmenting and predicting scenarios in neural brain tumors. We work with the airways. I'm gonna show you examples from bronchoscopy and this work. And nodule classification is one thing that we implemented that works really nicely. We, we trained the, the models on open data sets and then adapt them to, to local data as soon as we get access to it. And in uh, digital pathology, I think AI has a ma very major role in the future. And we have, a, we have two big projects on, on digital pathology at the moment uh, and AI analysis. 
Uh, so moving a little bit uh, away from radiology, but I'll come back to the radiological images. We are following this uh, sort of evolution in therapy where you start uh, on the left side from open surgery, going to minimal access surgery with keyhole surgery in the abdomen, as one example, to the future where you will have much more localized treatment and uh, non-invasive therapy. Uh, you deliver the energy to a target inside the body in many, you can do this in many different ways through needles, probes, or even non-invasively using ultrasound, therapeutic ultrasound, for instance. Also robotics is part of this picture. I should mention it because it's, uh, it's something that uh, a lot of the groups that we uh, collaborate with work on and we are working with it. And it's uh, currently there is only one uh, robotic solution or it's called robotic solution. I, will, I could explain to you a lot around that, but it's not a robot. It's more a telemetric manipulator, if you will. But there are robots uh, appearing now on the market, true robots that can work autonomously. The thing is, the, the level of autonomy that these uh, machines can, uh, can show is uh, everything from no, where the surgeon does all the work, to assistance, to task and uh, autonomy, and then you have so on until you have full autonomy, which is uh, something we don't uh, expect to see in the near future at all, actually, not in surgery. But task autonomy is something that we are looking for and something that uh, we are testing even. Um, the future will consist of robots together with humans and you have to find a way for them to work together. So you have to avoid collisions. You have to be able to give the robots uh, sight. We have a big uh, project uh, called the Rumo in uh, Sintef together with uh, several partners that we, where we do robotics for moving objects. And in this scenario, you use imaging to detect the surface where you're gonna place an ultrasound probe you use the images and use AI technology to detect features in the image, structures in the image, to know where to localize what you're looking for and to scan, let's say if it's for a diagnostic follow-up scan. And the, the advantage for using robotics and AI in this context is that you get a very robust and repeatable uh, way of doing things. You avoid some, in, some observer uh, variability and you get a, a solution that is uh, automatic, of course, and you can, uh, you can save some man hours there also. Um, a lot of the things we do uh, in our group uh, at Sintef and TNU and St. Olaf is that we work on uh, software development uh, using AI techniques that we implement in this platform. The platform is open source uh, since 2015. It's called Custus X, and you can find it online and, and have a look at it. It's uh, free to download and use for anything. You can even download it and sell it if you want to. Uh, but one example of a field where we use this uh, that I promised to show you a little bit more detail on is uh, bronchoscopy. In uh, bronchoscopy, the, the pulmonologist, the doctor, is interested to find uh, a lesion inside the lungs where he wants to or she wants to take a sample to diagnose uh, a suspicious lesion, to find out whether it's cancer, how dangerous the cancer is, and so on. You can determine a lot of this from just the images, and this is something we are working on, but some lesions you have to sample to determine uh, the correct treatment uh, from that point. So in order to be able to increase the success rate of these biopsies, uh, we are developing navigation principles, guiding principles for the pulmonologist to be able to uh, successfully sample the correct target inside the, the body. So earlier, this is what the, 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 the doctors had to work with. They had the CT images from before the operation where they have the diagnostic CT. They can scroll through and look for the, the lesion and try to make a mental map of where to go inside the 3D structure. And the 3D structure is, is rather complex because the lungs, they divide in two 23 or more times. So it's, a, it's easy to get lost and it's easy to take a wrong left or right somewhere down the road and then get, uh, get into the wrong uh, airways and not be successful biopsy. So, so the, the image to the right is the, the live video image that they see during the procedure. So what we are uh, doing is using AI techniques to extract and detect and extract and classify all the different organs, uh, mainly the lung relevant organs, of course, uh, airways, lesions, lymph nodes. Lymph nodes are important if you want to determine uh, the, the severity of the cancer. 
So if it's spread, you have uh, you have a positive detection on the other side of uh, or the opposite side of the body, which is uh, important to find out uh, early on. So to the to detect and segment and classify these lymph nodes, this is really tricky. So one way is to, to segment all the other structures in addition, and then you you are more easily can say with certainty which lymph nodes uh, belong where inside the the body. So. Instead of showing just a 2D slice, you can show a virtual bronchoscopy before the procedure like this, where you basically give the doctor a fly through of the procedure going to the target. So then you can mentally prepare, okay, I'm gonna take a left and two rights, and then I'm gonna go into this branch. And if I instead go into this branch to the right, I get a more better access to the tumor and can sample it and, and then diagnose it afterwards. And when you have these, uh, these segmentations and in different visualizations, you can do almost anything according to your fantasy, how to visualize it. This is just some examples. Up to the left, you can see that you're inside the airways, but you have made the airways uh, transparent. So you can see the lymph nodes on the outside uh, directly during your procedure. Uh, we are using tracking right now to track the bronchoscope as the, the procedure moves. But in the future, we see that we might be able to track the position using AI technology and the video image alone. This is an exciting feature and we have offered this as a master science uh, uh, project to, to the AI lab uh, for uh, the coming semester. So if you're interested, please uh, get in touch with me afterwards and we can talk more about that. Uh, in addition, we want to combine this with real-time imaging, which is very important in lymph node the staging. And, that, and for this, uh, we use ultrasound. The doctors use ultrasound to make sure that they get a sample from the, not only the correct lymph node, but also don't poke into any arteries or things like this. You can see a, a picture in the middle in the light blue area where you see the, the, the ultrasound probe. Uh, that they use and they have a needle coming out and entering the image that they can see where they, where they sample it from. So we are trying to combine this ultrasound now into the, and co-register it with the CT and the PET CT so that the, the doctors have all the necessary knowledge in one place in one screen during the procedure. That's the important part. And for ultrasound, we are actually, I would say that the, the team in, in Trondheim is internationally leading the way on AI and ultrasound. Uh, this is an example from a colleague of mine. Uh, his name is Eric Smista. He did a PhD at uh, the AI lab a few years back. And now he's, uh, he's, a, he's finished with his postdoc at the NTNU ISB at, uh, at the hospital. And he has made a, a very interesting platform called FAST where he can basically in real time do AI interpretation, detection and classification of features, structures in the ultrasound images. This is something we only a few years ago, we did not think this would be possible, but, uh, but now we are doing it in several clinical fields. And it's really uh, useful for learning to interpret ultrasound and to use ultrasound in practice for doctors. Uh, and also for experienced ones, they can get documentation of what they're doing. This is an example from uh, anesthesia, so nerve blocking, where you see uh, bone uh, vessels and the nerve bundle in yellow. It's a bit difficult to see in the middle of the image, but but just by showing this uh, in real time, annotated live to the doctor, you have a higher degree of security feeling, you have documentation, and as I said, you can do use this for teaching purposes as well. And to be able to do this kind of uh, AI uh, real time work, we need to annotate the data, of course. This is the hard work of, of AI sometimes. Um, acquiring the data and annotating the data. We have something called the annotation web that we use for this purpose. Uh, it is a web link that is that can be sent to the doctor who, or the expert who does the annotation. And we set it up so that it's really simple to, to do with buttons and boxes, bounding boxes or, or points. And then you label these and immediately everything that you do is saved. So you don't have to remember where you were. You don't have to do any tedious installation of any software or things like this. This is really out of the box in a web browser, useful for annotation work. Uh, if you want to know more about this, you can go to, to GitHub and have a look at the, the, the FAST framework. Uh, it's open source also. And we're using, there is some test data included there that Eric put out for, uh, for uh, students, etc., who wants to test and get started, familiarize themselves with this. 
So that, that was a short uh, and quick, I hope I didn't talk too fast and uh, happy to answer questions and discuss with you afterwards more examples if you want to know. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, uh, Thomas. We have uh, one question for you here. And the question is, uh, what? Yes, stop share screen. Uh, okay. The question is, how far do you think we are from fully auto autonomous operations? And do you think we will ever reach it? Uh, I, I have some doubts that we will reach it. It would be fun. Uh, it would be interesting for some standardized procedures to, to do that, uh, to explore that. But I think task autonomy and assisting devices that work in a robotic fashion are the first step. And, uh, mm -hmm. and please don't be misled by this uh, Da Vinci robot, which is not really a robot. Uh, it has some uh, robotic-like features. It can uh, filter uh, tremor. It can filter out movement, scale movement, zoom, auto zoom, and things like this. But it doesn't do anything that the surgeon doesn't do by the console. So it's not really mm -hmm. a robot. But uh, the only robot on the market now is a blood drawing robot. So it can draw okay. automatically. And the, the thing is with this robot is that it sees with optic, it sees with infrared below the surface for the vessels, and it uses ultrasound to verify where to poke the needle. And it's uh, mm -hmm. it's been tested, I think, it will, I don't know the number of cases, but it was better than humans, actually. So it, it only needs one try every time. <laughs> That's the only robot uh, commercially available I, uh, that I know. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Thomas. Very inspiring to hear your work. Thanks. Now, we, yes, thank you. Now we'll have a short break of five minutes. And after break, Jonathan Whitlock and Jules Sadler will have their presentations. So we will be back at 1747. <laughs> 